Hey there. This is Andrew Osta. Here I am in beautiful San Miguel de Allende. I'm staying at a friend's house here. Uh, just a beautiful house with a beautiful view you could see. Hopefully you can see San Miguel downtown behind me. Anyway. Uh, I've been wanting to share my testimony and I think I've I've shared it a couple of times on YouTube, but I don't know, somehow I always feel like it's incomplete. Um, but back in 2009 and 10, when I went to Peru, I was going to be a, a shaman. I was studying to be a shaman, and I, I did this whole ayahuasca apprenticeship in Iquitos. I stayed for almost nine months in, in Iquitos, in the jungle, which is being very immersed in into this whole world of shamanism and this was it was kind of the the peak of my involvement i mean i was i was for years before that i was experimenting and and practicing and getting there and then this was the peak this was kind of like i, I just went all in and i gave it my everything and 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 um i wrote it all in in my book, in my first book, Shamans and Healers, which was basically written as a diary. It was written day by day as the events were happening. I was just writing it down. And, and then I pretty much published the whole book without any real reflection or, con or conclusion, sort of leaving it up to the reader to, to make sense of it. But that was the peak. And then from there, I went down, um, went down and, um, and sort of um, distance myself from from shamanism and from all these things. So, I mean, I don't know where to start. I mean, I've been going, you know, I've been a seeker. I've been a spiritual seeker. I've been seeking God or seeking the meaning of life for at least, at least since I was 12, at least. I think before the age of 12, I was, I was too much um, interested in, you know, in childish things. And then, and then somehow when we moved from Ukraine, from communist Ukraine to Canada, when I was 12, I think that, um, that change of environment, this radical change led me to seek meaning because, um, Initially, like you know, in the first few months or something, I was, I was very fascinated with the abundance of all these material things in Canada. For example, chocolate bars and candies and and fast food and all these things that we didn't have in Ukraine. And then video games and and arcades, which we didn't have in Ukraine. And and then money and which we didn't have in Ukraine. You know, like in in Canada. Uh, I just, I just was immediately drawn in by all these things because, like, I was so into video games and I didn't have any money, so to to, to play video games, I would, I, would, I realized pretty quickly that there were like water fountains all over Toronto where we were living, and people would throw coins into the water fountains, and if I could get a magnet on a string. I could throw it into the water fountain um, and I could fish out some quarters and then I could go to the arcade and play some video games. So I figured this out pretty quickly and uh, started, you know, getting my money to play my video games like that. And then I, um, and then I um, also would just like, s there was this store called Future Shop, <laughs> which was a, a tech store. And they always had video games hooked up to the TV and you could just go there and play. And I would spend hours just standing there and playing these games. I mean, I didn't care what anybody thought of me. I was like this little 12 year old kid who spoke almost no English. And, you know, if the games were turned on, uh, that's what I would do. And then there was a golf course near where we lived and I, I would collect the golf balls that were, you know, find them in, in, in some in the river or whatever in the forest in the woods and then i would take them to the local consignment store and sell them for 50 cents each or something like that and then i would go and play my games so this was this was sort of my life 
you know in the first years in Canada it was just it was just you know trying to get money to get these uh, these things the entertainment and and maybe snacks and toys so it's kind of like the living the American dream you know <laughs> as a poor immigrant uh, and um, what can I say I mean I don't think I wasn't a good person I mean I was I was just very interested in myself and um, sort of um, satisfying my own desires and, and everybody I met was kind of like I don't remember having close friendships at this point like I had close friends in Ukraine but I, I don't remember forming any close friendships you know in the first couple of years in Canada because because it was all like we were all kind of like using each other you know like and everybody was just trying to to um, get something from somebody else I mean that's how it was and and I was the same way uh, and then uh, within the first couple of years uh, once we moved we moved from Toronto to Hamilton in Hamilton it was uh, in Toronto I was I didn't have to speak English I didn't even need to speak English I could just function by um, by speaking with all my Russian speaking you know neighbors the the apartment building where we were living in New York uh, in North York just had like 60 percent Russian population so we could just communicate in Russian and even in school even in school I had three or four people speaking Russian in my class which I could I could communicate with them I didn't need to speak English then I moved uh, with my family to Hamilton and in Hamilton um, in Hamilton it was a totally different situation the school had maybe three immigrants in total or maybe six I mean three of them were Asians and then three non-Asians and um, and we were getting bullied I mean that that was that was the, the harsh reality like I, I I don't know in Canadian school you got to fit in especially in high school you got to fit into one of these groups and stay within that group or you're going to get basically picked on and beat up and spit on and whatever and abused in every way so <laughs> there were these you know sort of um what groups were there? there there were i don't know there were probably the smart kids and the nerds or whatever and then there were the sports kids and then there were the um the um, heavy metal goth kids and then there were you know somebody else and i just like didn't fit into any of those groups because when you're when you're an immigrant like we, well we had to form our own group like of of immigrants which consisted of like three non-asian immigrants because the, the the asian immigrants were like a group upon themselves so so i didn't fit very well into the the school system and and it was you know this this uh, bullying and this kind of lack of true friendship in a way and and this hedonistic sort of just entertainment seeking thing and um, what happened was that one of my friends who was uh, one of my friends who was sort of more into substances and drugs than I was. I mean, I wasn't really into it, but, but you couldn't avoid like smoking weed or anything because somebody would be doing it and then you would, you would eventually try it, obviously. But this, this other friend of mine, he was into mushrooms. So he, um, I don't know what grade I was in, 10 or something probably. Like, probably when I was in grade 10 or 11, uh, we had a mushroom trip together. And when I had that mushroom trip, um, I saw the emptiness of, of this whole life that I was leading and the whole, the way the society was working over there and the, like just everything that was going on from the clothes that I was wearing to, to, you know, to the food that I was eating to, to, to what I was watching on TV. It was all, I was just like a non-entity. I, I mean, I don't know how to say it. I was a part of a crowd. I was just, I was just like doing I was like a puppet doing exactly what somebody wanted everybody to do like obeying commercials and uh, on TV and uh, you know just I had no individuality I had nothing 
nothing that was mine. It was it was like I was just living. I was like a, a, a screw or a bolt in this machine, basically. That you know, and I saw this. I saw my entire life and my future of. Uh, the, how I'm gonna go to university, I'm gonna study, and then I'm gonna get this job, and I'm gonna work, and then I'm gonna retire, and I'm gonna die, you know? That's, I, I mean, I was like, whoa, uh, I don't wanna, you know, I, I'm not enjoying school, <laughs> you know? And I'm, I'm not, I, I don't know what I'm gonna study. Like, you know, I didn't I didn't know what I was gonna study. I felt like, like we had no, uh, no time to think about it. We had really no um, guidance. Like nobody was trying to orient us, kids, as to what we're supposed to be doing in the future. It was kind of like, yeah, just pass these classes, and then apply to some schools and whatever. Whoever takes you, you're, that's where you're going, uh, you know. And then apply to some companies, and whoever takes you, that's where you're going. And it's like, uh, you know, you might not get your first choice, but you might get your second or third or whatever, you know. And it was just like it was just an unsatisfying uh, prospect for my life at that point. So I um, I started seeking. That's when I started seeking. I was like, okay, this psychedelic, this mushrooms. I mean, it opened something to me. I saw the beauty in nature. I saw the emptiness of my own life. I saw, you know, I saw the beauty in people. And I was like, well, there's something more. And, and I think it was also my first sort of uh, aesthetic experience in in the in the sense that uh, I began to appreciate music and and visual images more than, you know, I had previously because it kind of opened my senses up. <laughs> and up to that point, I was like, like I, w I would be listening to really pretty bad music, like, I mean, heavy metal and stuff like that, just, just whatever was popular so that I could get in with the popular kids, that's what I would be uh, listening to. Um, and um, you know, I was I'm pretty sure I was tone deaf. I couldn't even tell that you know, I couldn't even um, you know tell whether something was in key or not in key or what you know the harmony. Like none none of that stuff. I, that all came later. Anyway, um, so I just started getting interested in different you know in different clothes and different. <laughs> music and different things that I, that I wasn't interested in previously and um, and and I also because I couldn't get mushrooms easily and I couldn't you know it was illegal and you know there was always this issue of well what if you know the cops catch us or something and plus it's not something that you want to do like you know every day or something or every week even it's it was an intense experience and it wasn't easy to get and etc etc so I basically started looking for explanations like what happened to me what was that experience and you know what happened I guess I was in in some sense I had a glimpse of enlightenment I you know I woke up a little bit from my from my um, slumber uh, and then I started looking you know at legal psychedelics and stuff like that so uh, together with with um, meditations and new age books and spiritual books. So this, let's say if I, um, if I took mushrooms maybe at the age of 15 or something, for the next 12 years or so, I basically experimented with all kinds of meditations and um, substances, mostly natural, because I wasn't, I wasn't very much into drugs, you know, like, um, chemical stuff so but I tried to experiment with the natural things I was and I was uh, I felt like I was being called to uh, towards sort of two paths one is like this being sort of a I don't know a guru like I never wanted to be a guru really but uh, but I was very much drawn to these gurus and and the, the Hindu way and and you know this monk life and chanting and fasting and and doing all these things that was one side and the other side was the psychedelics and and the plants and and the shaman is the shaman way because both well i mean both basically both of those ways were just ways of reaching some higher plane of existence that was beyond this material 
and um, and I was um, practicing both, uh, f you know, for all for those years. I've, I've been going. I was going to different kinds of temples. I wasn't um, sort of um, limited to any one religion or one way. I would go, you know, if there's a Buddhist gathering on Tuesday, I'll go to the Buddhist gathering on Tuesday. And on Sunday, there was a Hare Krishna, I would go to that. And on Thursday, there was, you know, a Siddha Yoga, I would go to that. And, and whatever other day there was anything going on, I would go to that. If some guru was coming, I would go to see that guru. And, and then if I had, a, you know, an evening free and no homework or whatever, and I had some substance, then I would take that substance, that plant, usually plant-based and I would, you know, try to, um, you know, reach towards the spirit in that way. And I think um, during, you know, dur it was during this sort of this period of seeking that I be became interested in, in art. I found out that I had a, um, an ability to draw and paint and express myself. I, I do some interesting things symbolically and, and I had sort of a knack for patterns and for uh, um, um, proportions and harmony and things like that like it just kind of came naturally to me and for color so I started getting into uh, into art and um, and I also I also started getting into music because because um, art takes a while it takes a while to draw something and to express something and it's just another way of expression I just, I just got hooked on expressing myself, and and then I could, if I could, you know, some you could express emotion in a different way through sound than you can through visual image, and it's also more uh, immediate. So you could, you know, you could just strum a couple of chords on a guitar if you know how to play, or on a piano or whatever, and you could express yourself like really quickly. And and um, when those moments, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm explaining myself well, but there's, uh, there, there were these moments of like an intense need to express myself and um, just to get whatever was inside out, whatever that might be, whether it's, it might be some emotion, I mean, linked to, you know, to relationships or my family or a girlfriend or whatever, or just myself or my own sort of hang-ups or or some idea that I mean it could be anything but there was like a need of getting it out like uh, and I I wrote uh, extensively I um, composed songs I wrote songs I sang I I painted I drew right and um, and all of this sort of culminated in me reading about ayahuasca and trying it a couple of times um, on my own and then I really got um, interested in it and I, I decided to go to Peru and that's where my book sort of starts I went to Peru and I had all these supernatural experiences um, just a lot of supernatural experiences uh, they're not I, I wouldn't say they're hallucinations um, I've had experiences where multiple people, you know, if you want to call it a hallucination, they share the hallucination. I don't think, I don't think those things are hallucinations. I don't think the experiences that we have on psychedelics are hallucinations. I think they're glimpses into another reality. So um, I wouldn't say that they're hallucinations. And um, although I quit, I quit, I don't. I'm not denying that there's power in in that way. I mean, I know that there is power. I've seen very powerful things happen, and I've seen very powerful people over there in the jungles of Peru. Um, so it's not that there's no power, but it's it's like it's like a dark power, and it's um, I don't know. I don't know if I can say it's an evil power. It's just it's really hard to describe it. But it's it's like you gotta have. A compass you got to have a connection with God you got to know what that feels like and you got to know when something comes at you in a ceremony or in a vision or during a psychedelic experience you got to know whether that's God coming to you and it's the light coming to you or if it's the darkness uh, coming to you disguised as a 
angel of light. I mean, darkness can come disguised as light. And the way that that happens is it, it's like very sweet in the beginning. It comes and it, it pulls you in. And if you go with that, um, how can I describe it? It's, it's sort of like, imagine, imagine spiritually there's space. There's like a tunnel, a long tunnel that leaves you, leads you to the place of darkness from where you are and an agent of darkness comes as a light as a, as a pretending to be an agent of goodness uh, giving you pleasure giving you a vision giving you like an or orgasmic feeling whatever it might be and while you're having that and accepting that feeling and participating and, and enjoying that you're being taken to that place of darkness and and then that feeling ends and you're in the place of darkness. That's, I mean, that that it's it's hard to talk about things that are invisible and um, spiritual. But that's pretty much what it is. Uh, and while I was there, I was, let's just say, because I dabbled in all these different spiritual ways and shamanism, and Buddhism, and Hinduism, and of course I had a little bit of Christianity in me just by default because everybody knows a little bit of, you know everybody knows the you know whether the um ten commandments or the adam and eve story or something else i mean those those stories are sort of part of our um almost part of our dna now part of our subconscious because they've been told for so many you know generations especially for somebody coming from a christian background like like i did with my uh, my great grandparent was a was a priest, a Russian Orthodox priest. So I, I've had I had some of that, and I was trying to make sense of it. So I was during my time of seeking, I was meditating, you know, on Adam and Eve and the tree, or something like that, or you know, the creation of the world, and just trying to understand it. What is this? What happened? What is this sin or this fall? Uh, I'm, I was trying to understand these stories. Like I knew that there was something more to them, but I couldn't. I couldn't understand what they were exactly, what it meant exactly. I, I could, and there's so many different angles that one could understand those stories from. Like say the the story of Adam and Eve and eating the fruit and the fall from the Garden of Eden. Just that story alone, you could see it from you know 35 different angles, and and I, that's what I was doing. But I couldn't. There was no. I was aware that there was no angle there was no angle that gave me the full perspective like there's nothing I, I didn't understand like the deepest level of it I could understand all these different superficial levels so so while I was you know seeking I was also contemplating some of those things that that I had heard or you know read or, or knew somehow from the Bible and while I was in the in Peru and having these psychedelic visions and doing ayahuasca ceremonies at least twice a week for um, I don't know 30 or 40 weeks in a row, um, I was deeply I was becoming deeply confused. I was becoming deeply confused because all of these beliefs and practices were just getting mingled together, and I was trying to make sense of everything. And <laughs> I had the illusion that I knew something. I had the illusion that I, I was knowledgeable, that I, that I was also that I was progressing, that I was making progress, that I was learning, that I was getting more spiritual, of whatever it was. I mean, I, 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 I felt that my teacher was a great, you know, a great, great asset in my life, that he was a fantastic, amazing shaman, like the most amazing person that I've known and just being there like I don't uh, I, I probably like I'm not making myself clear or something this guy had like 12 students who were some of them have been with him for years and here I am I'm, I come in and I he like takes me so close to him um, he basically makes me live in his house i didn't want to live in his house but he makes me live in his house so i am for months i am 
just like this with this guy. Like we're having breakfast every day. We're having lunch every day. Every day I spend hours with him in his consultation room. We live in the same house. We see each other in morning, evening, and night. I mean, it was like, why me? Why was I, why was I given this privilege or whatever, being that close to, to this shaman who had 12 disciples, but none of them, none of them were anywhere near as close as I was to him. I was just like closer than all of them. And, and I got to see stuff that, you know, other people didn't see. And, and I got to really, I don't know, just to really see somebody, see this person operating closely uh, during a period of eight or nine, uh, eight months, you know, eight months. Um, and what can I say? There came a disappointment. There came a disappointment in the shaman. And mostly the disappointing was uh, in lying. Like, um, he, he had like a pathological almost necessity to lie. And this would, it could be expressed in, in big things like, um, it could be, it could be, you know, if a patient stopped coming and he says that that patient's healed, but really that patient died, big thing. Um, it could be expressed in like money things. Oh, we had a, you know, we had a, an incident. Like we gotta pay for this, we gotta pay for that. Can you give me money? Oh, I need money for this. I need money for that. We're gonna make a road, you know, give me three thousand dollars the road never gets made, you know, whatever things he said he needed the money for don't exist. So the second thing of money and and um, lying about it. And then there were just unnecessary little lies like, you know, just on the smallest everyday things that that actually don't matter. But it was even like, if he, would, he would even lie like, you know, if he took a, a, a taxi or a bus or something and the bus cost like 10 cents, he would say that he paid 15 cents, you know, just stuff like that. It was just ridiculous little lies all over the place. And um, so there was that problem with lying, with money, and, and as a good sort of um, spiritual um, seeker that I was, I... Um, I kept thinking, okay, I'm being tested, you know, I'm, I've got attachments, maybe I got attachments to money, maybe I got, you know, maybe I, I need to trust this guy more, maybe I need to give away all my money and see what happens, and, you know, maybe that's what I'm supposed to be doing, maybe, maybe he's just testing my attachment, which is, you know, so it's sort of a valid point, but, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, I mean, what I'm trying to communicate is that I was this close with a very, very powerful person um, in Peru, living in this house, sort of working to get together, learning from him, and um, and I try to give it my all. I mean, I really gave it my all. I mean, whenever in doubt, I would just go with whatever this guy said. I mean, I would it would be like total obedience, you know as a monk would have total obedience to to their um master or their guru that's that's what i was uh, doing because that's where i was coming from i was i was learning about these gurus and their disciples who would do everything they say and just put their total trust in the guru and that's what i did and this guy was not a guru he was uh he was um a flawed human being you know second marriage or third marriage at the age of less than 40. He had, you know, these children who would never see him. Um, I mean, I don't want to get into it now, but it was some kind of magic, some kind of whatever he did 
that made me just love the guy. It made me love him more than almost more than I love my family. Like literally love him as, you know, somewhere between my best friend and my my, you know, mother, something like that. Just a very intense love. And um and in a weird way, even though I saw that he was lying and he was, you know, taking advantage of me and everything, because I loved him, I would let him do those things. You know, I kind of just played along. And it was like, in the end, when he was asking for money for this or that purpose, I knew that he was lying and I would still give it to him. Be like, here, take it, you know, like, I don't believe whatever you're saying, but take my money. out. What do I care? I made like, uh, you know, I, I worked for a year, I, I saved up 25000 or something and I spent all of it in Peru and I gave it all away. Um, but, so there was the disappointment with this, with this guy and uh, I think what I'm trying to say here is that, I mean, or I didn't say, is that when you're when you're this close to a very powerful spiritual being like a shaman or a guru or whatever you basically you, you're kind of like really under a spell and it's really easy for that person to control you and it's really easy for them to control your what what, what you think and you know uh i mean i could get into all these tactics that that i think pretty sure were used against me to control me and to um, make me into a uh, just an obedient little zombie um, those include sort of ex the, 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 the tactics include exhaustion getting you always being tired always being pressured into doing something like you never have a free time to reflect or to rest um, so for us to um, to um, make informed decisions and and realize what's going on and sort of get a perspective on our life we need to take a break like we need to get away from the, the grind and uh, just step away and slowly you'll begin to see what's really going on but when when it's like from morning to night like hey it's morning like we got to do this hey it's afternoon like you got to do this you got to do that hey in the evening we're having a ceremony and then you're you're not getting enough sleep you're you're doing all these drugs and substances you're doing all kinds of other stuff that the that the guru or the shaman or whoever is getting you to do and this grind this um uh, non-stop sort of thing where you don't have even a day or half a day to, to rest that that makes your mind very cloudy and that makes you easy to control so that was I mean that was one of our um, that was one of the tactics that was being very much being used um, in my book I mentioned in the Kama Sutra in the Kama Sutra there are ways that uh, it talks in, in one part of Kama Sutra about how a woman can uh, manipulate a man and um, those tactics are what the shaman was using also to manipulate his disciples and me in particular um, and of course I, I mean this maybe this goes without saying but when you take a powerful psychedelic uh, substance like ayahuasca with you know with the shaman like that that cup that liquid that you're drinking that was chanted into that was prayed over that was spiritually imbu imbued with whatever he wanted to imbue it with so it's like you're you're just drinking what you, you're, you're basically taking you know he's got the magic spell that cup is not just it's not just the plant it's it's the plant plus his magic spell plus his incantations plus his songs plus his intentions plus whatever whatever he wants to put into it and you're taking that in into you so you're giving him control you're like the moment you're doing that like you're giving a lot of control to that shaman that you drink with and um in my own experience he could read my thoughts he could address my thoughts he knew what i was thinking um which made it very difficult 
to think independently because as soon as you start to deviate from what he wants you to think, he actually addresses it. <laughs> so he's like, hey, I know you're thinking this thing. Don't, don't doubt. Don't, uh, don't think those things. It's from the devil. It's from the enemy. It's not like, you know, it's not, um, uh, that's not the way for you. Like, you got to stay, you, you got to keep thinking this way that I'm telling you to think. And, and because you're in no man's land, you don't know where you're going. You don't know, the, you don't have a map. You don't know where's the destination. You don't know where you are. It's like you're walking through um, a jungle in the dark. And there's this person who's promising that he's going to take you to, the, to an oasis or like the Holy Grail or something. And that person's a, a dishonest person. That person's a liar. And you know he's a liar. And you know he's taking advantage of you along the way. But you have nowhere else to go and you don't know how to get out of that jungle because you're in the middle of it and you don't know how to you don't know where to go so it's like you're really in a bind and that's why i don't know if i mean i've probably said this in my book and elsewhere but once you open yourself up to these things um you're really uh it's like i don't know i don't know how, what what the analogy is like all it once you open up you're you're halfway you're more than halfway lost i mean you're <sighs> can't find the right words it's it, what i'm trying to say is like don't open up your don't open yourself up to this to these things to the spiritual people leaders who are going to take advantage of you i mean unless you you unless you have studied that person and you've seen their life and you've seen their family you've seen how they um how they function over a long period of time and you can really say like you know what i want to be like this person i like this person is is like you know a holy person is a saint okay in that case like you can open yourself up to that person but um Pretty much, hundred percent of the shamans are not saints. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, when you open yourself up to that person, you give them certain access to you, and they can manipulate you. And you've agreed to that, and you've basically taken in this cup that comes with a spiritual component, and it's like a remote control. And you lose your um, judgment and your, you know, your own sort of willpower and all that. And you think that your teacher is the best thing that ever happened. And it doesn't matter what anybody tells you. If anybody had a different experience with that person, um, you're not going to listen. Um, there's a lot to this story. Um, let's just say I'll, I'll just elaborate a little bit more so the way that this this particular shaman that i um stayed with what he would do is he would do consultations consultations which is you know people come to him and you see these you probably see announcements or something you know oh you have trouble with your love life or with your money or with whatever like come and you know come and i'll give you a consultation and this consultation may be free or it may be very cheap and so you come and you sit in front of this person and for for very cheap he will tell you some stuff about your life and you know what what issues you have and some of that stuff might be true and might be even um very surprising that he knows it so once you 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 hear that consultation it's like you you're opening this bag of can of worms you've opened it right and now these worms are all over the place and he says well uh now i've told you your problems and what you need to do now you have to do you know a series of ceremonies or rituals or something or other and you, ha you have to pay me significantly more money um that's step two so now you're uh, at a crossroads now you're trying to think okay what what do i do do i continue with this person or do i 
you know, go and try to solve my problem on my own. Um, if you choose to continue with that person, that's not going to be the end of it. Like there's going to be more and more problems and more and more money and whatever. It's, it's just going to keep coming back. I mean, he'll deal with one problem. You'll pay him in a week or so or in two weeks or in some time. There's going to be another problem and you're going to keep coming back to that person and paying more and more money to deal with more and more problems. The other way is you go, go the other way and you're going to deal with it on your own. You're not going to be able to do that because you've already given that person authority and he has done he has assigned spirits to you he's done stuff that if you go on your own bad things are going to happen to you i don't know if i'm making myself clear so it's a no-win situation once you once you get that consultation once you open the door to that spiritual uh whoever that is tarot card reader or or um or shaman or whoever there's there's n it's a no-win situation it's a lose-lose if you do what they say you're gonna keep paying the money for until they milk you dry um, or if you go the other way bad stuff's gonna happen to you so just don't even start that's what I'm saying don't even start and if you've started then c you gotta do something you gotta pray against it you gotta cut it cut those things and repent you know and just have that com realization that you've done wrong and ask God to help you right uh, so in my case in my case I went um, I went for a first ceremony with this person I went for a ceremony I liked it I enjoyed it whatever at the end of the ceremony he says you need to come back to me for another two or three ceremonies which are going to cost you fifty dollars each and I, I was I was like well you know I don't want to I don't want to do more ceremonies with you at, at, at the moment I was I was like I had other plans and I don't want to give you this money right so I was very sort of taking with this I was very excited with the ceremony with what I seen and heard and, and experienced on the day and then on the second day when i came back i came back to that house and i saw all these people and i it just it just felt like you know i don't want to be here so i i did come back and i was going to pay him and do these other things and and then i changed my mind i said you know what i don't want to do this i want to just be on my own and this led to a whole series of events within within two or three weeks Within two or three weeks, I get um, I get robbed. My stuff gets stolen. I get accused of the robbery. Then I get sick with malaria, double malaria, normal malaria and cerebral malaria. And I get sick with malaria at another shaman's uh, property. And he's try and he tries very hard. This this guy called Artiduro who used to live in. Iquitos, and then he moved to Pucallpa. I don't know where he lives now. He used to be the shaman of the Rainbow community over in Iquitos. So this guy was trying very hard to keep me in his um, in his retreat center away from the city. And he was telling me like, "Oh, you got nothing. Don't worry. Like you're gonna feel great. Like everything's gonna be okay. Drink some more ayahuasca. Like you're gonna be fine." While I was with malaria and feeling horrible, and telling him, "You know what? Like this is not helping me. I'm feeling." very i've never felt so bad in my life and he would be just <laughs> yeah don't worry it's just the, the weather it's just the that it was raining now it's sunny you're gonna come and drink some more ayahuasca i drink some more ayahuasca tomorrow or oh, you're gonna be just fine just just relax you know listen to my songs and if i ever knew an evil person that guy was evil he was evil but you know when, once all this happened and I despite what he was telling me went to the city and how somehow somebody diagnosed me with malaria and I was able to get treatment and not die uh, when I went and I tell, told that story and some other stories uh, with, with the same guy Archie Duro um, th there was a, a guy who came to see him and then this guy wanted to go to the city and go to the shamanism conference. 
and and an Artidur the shaman was like no uh don't go like stay with me keep drinking with me ayahuasca don't go to that ser- don't, don't go to that uh conference and this guy's like well i want to go and he's like no don't go so he goes anyway he goes anyway um He's, he goes on a motorcycle. His hat flies off. He's kind of like tries to grab it or something. Crashes the motorcycle. Breaks his arm in multiple places. Just a really ugly, nasty break. Goes to the hospital. They do an expensive treatment. Take a bunch of money from him. And the treatment is just wrong and badly done. And he needs to buy an emergency ticket to the United States and do another treatment. And he, so he does all this, all this suffering, all this financial loss. And then what happens, I mean, I don't know if this is true, but Artiduro himself told me that that guy was calling him to come to the United States and work with him because he's suffering from all this sort of bad luck, this, the curse or whatever it is, the curse of the shaman, this just terrible negative things happening one behind another and what it what i mean there's two ways of looking at one is like the shaman the shaman will tell him of course i told you don't go there you went there you didn't listen to me now pay me and i'll you know remove that that curse right and then you're like, okay, I'm gonna fly the shaman into the United States so he can, so he can heal me. And you spend another two thousand dollars to fly the guy in and feed him and whatever, and fly him back out, right? And did it happen because you didn't listen to him, or did it didn't happen because because he wanted it to happen? And I mean, it's the same thing. It it happened because because you've given somebody power over you and then you didn't listen to to that person didn't do exactly what they say you've you've become a slave in a sense and when you don't do what they want you to do bad things happen to you and that's who's to blame for that there's nobody to blame because you've selected that for yourself when you have accepted becoming a slave to this person so but when 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 i went i told about those stories to the rainbow community where 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 artidura was their shaman nobody listened to me nobody nobody cared nobody believed it and i saw another guy with the same with the same guy artidura there was he had a disciple who just looked like death the guy looked like he was gonna die like he was he was he looked so sick and he was so happy and saying, "Oh, my teacher's the best thing ever," and like I'm learning so much. Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm so spiritual. But anybody, you don't have to be, you know, clairvoyant to see that this guy was just heading straight down, and he was completely delusional. And I told him, "I'm like, you know what? That teacher that you think is so great, he's not, he's not so great. He, he wouldn't listen to me." So what happens is that you, once you, when you're very close and you give these people authority over your life. This bird just keeps chirping. Go away. (laughs) Um, Then, uh, you know, don't be surprised when bad things happen. So, I mean, I'm going to cut to the chase. This has been a long long testimony. Shut up, bird. Come on. It's annoying. I'm going to have to go inside. I'm going to go inside and finish the testimony inside okay um so ah that bird right here we go so um let me finish that that uh testimony Uh, so it took me, you know, eight or month, nine months um, to figure out that the way I was going, it wasn't going to get me anywhere, right? It wasn't getting me to where I wanted to go. But as I was saying, I needed space to realize this. Like when you don't have space, when you're that close to somebody very powerful, 
that person is basically uh, controls you and controls your worldview, your vision. And it's like you're under hypnosis and under a spell and you need space and time to begin to re regain your own vision, your own understanding and your own uh, will. So for me that happened because I fell in love in, in, uh, before uh, leaving to Peru. I fell in love with a girl from Mexico and I was so in love with her that I decided to um, take a couple of weeks off and, and go and visit her. And it was during these couple of weeks off that I was visiting her that I was away from, from the jungle. That's when I first began to realize that I was being taken advantage of and I was being lied to and that whatever I was doing, uh, that I was delusional, that I was um, being misled and I believed that I was, um, I have the song, I thought that I was going up but I was going down. That's what it was. I was going. I thought I was going up. I was going down. I only realized that when I hit the ground. Mm -hmm. So you you <laughs> you think you're going up, and then you slam against the ground, you know. And um, that's what it was. I was. I thought I was going up, and I was going down, and then I, boom. And when I hit the ground. Uh, it sort of all came falling apart and I realized just like how screwed I was um, and during those eight or nine months in Peru that I had these visions and all these things those things are not free those visions that you have and the understanding and the wisdom that comes it's not free it has a price it has a price and that price for me was everything just fell apart my uh relationship with my girlfriend that i really cared about fell apart all the money that i had saved up was gone my health was i, I began to get gray hair like right now it doesn't look too bad but i mean i'm what i'm 42 but at 15 years ago 27 i i got that gray hair from peru um from all the stress, I had to do all my teeth, all my fillings and everything were falling out. Um, you know, I had like, I was just, I had skin problems, I had parasites, I had like, I, you know, I, was, I had this malaria that I, I got over, but it was just, I had severe anxiety, like couldn't sleep. Um, I had to, I had a smoking addiction nicotine and i had an addiction to to, to, to the songs the shamanic um, songs it's like i had to practice i had to sing those songs where i wouldn't be able to, to to sleep i wouldn't be able to rest i had this constant anxiety i had attacks in my dreams i would you know I, I couldn't rest at night i would sleep and dream and i would see the shaman would come in and he would talk to me and tell me what to do and what not to do and it was like it was just exhausting. It wasn't, I wouldn't get any rest. I wouldn't get any rest. So, um, because I had bought, I purchased a two-way ticket to Peru, I, I did, uh, I mean, I could have given it up and whatever, just stayed there, but I really wanted to see my girlfriend. So, in, in a sense, this girl was what, you know, she was what pulled me out of it because, um, if it wasn't for her, I would probably stay there. And there, there was another girl over there that that I, you know, I was very infatuated with. And I, the only reason I didn't approach her or nothing happened is because I, I had this commitment, previous commitment. But I, um, I mean, I could definitely see myself, you know asking this other girl to marry me and just living in Peru. I mean, that could have, that could have happened. So, um, so because I had this girlfriend, I decided to come back to Canada and, and then go and see her and try to save our relationship and try to um, make it work out. And, um, and I was just like very broken. I was very broken after this, whole experience in Peru and everything that led up to it 
um, that I thought that I was enlightened. I thought that I was, you know, spiritual and I was doing all these things like I was so far, far out, you know, and seeing people get healed and and, you know, experiencing spirits and seeing visions of, you know, blah, 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 all this stuff. I thought I was I was on a high level. And um, but I was completely broken. I was completely anxious, depressed and not uh, suicidal per se. But I would have thoughts like when I was drive, I would I'd be driving and it would just be like a thought like, hey, like, what if you just drive off that bridge or like, what if you just drive into that tree at 100 miles an hour? You know, it was it was kind of like those kind of thoughts would just um, uh, make themselves present and I would just kind of like watch them and then you know sort of say like no I don't think I'm gonna do that because I have I have a family that loves me you know I don't want to really do that it's, it's it's like I don't care for myself but you know I don't want my mom or my sister to, to be you know upset that I uh, dro drove off a bridge or something you know I know that they would be um, devastated by that so um that kind of thing started to happen and then i went to mexico to look for my girl and um yeah it was a rough you know it was a rough time like she was i was pretty much losing her and she was working and she didn't have time for me and and i um and i um was trying to I started trying to basically deal with my own issues with my own problems and and I had some more ceremonies with peyote and with mushrooms and in, in different places in Mexico and temascal and just trying to to deal with my stuff and during a mushroom ceremony in in Huautla de Jimenez where the famous Maria Sabina uh, place um she asked me um what intention i had what i wanted to achieve from the ceremony and i couldn't think of anything and the only thing that i could think of was starting over i just wanted everything to just end i wanted um all of my past and everything that i've been doing up to that point just to be erased and i wanted a clean start and that's all i wanted and i just didn't know how to do that um, but that was the only thing I wanted. I was like, I don't want anything. I just want it all to go away. I want to just start over. I want to be, you know, as a Christian would say, born again or reborn. But I didn't know that that's what I was asking. I was just, I just need, I just need this all to be uh, over. I want a clean slate, a new life. And um, as it happened, I... I was led, let's just say, by somebody advised me to go to these other mountains in Oaxaca to this Christian healing center. And I thought, well, you know, why not? I'll go and check it out and see what they're doing because I, I was already writing my book and I needed more, um, I needed more uh, material for the book. So the only reason I went there really was just to get some more material for my book. And I'm always, I was always interested in different modalities and different ways that people heal and... Uh, these spiritual things so i i went to this place called el refugio in oaxaca which is now closed i mean that they've they've stopped operating um but they're christians they're not they're kind of messianic christians they're followers of yeshua followers of christ um who came from a pretty similar background as me in a sense because they were into yoga and into meditation and into a lot of things into plants and magic and um and i felt like they could understand where i was coming from and um basically after a couple of days of talking and just seeing what's going on over there i decided to give it a chance it's like um this this guy jose my spiritual uncle would say, Jose and Ella at El Refugio. Jose told me, like, he looked at me and he said, you need help. And nobody's ever told me that I needed help before. And I realized that he was right. I realized that he, you know, he, 
he could see that I needed help. And I was like, I was all very like hung up. And I just have a cross. But I was like, I had all these amulets and things that the gurus gave me and bracelets. And I was like, yeah, I'm so cool. You know, I've seen so many people. I, I've seen so many gurus. I got a blessing from this one, from that one. I had so many s different plants. And, and I, you know, all these shamans. And, you know, I know the songs and blah, 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 blah. So I thought I was cool. Uh, and he could see just right through all of that. And he, he, he just said, like, you need help, man. And I was like, okay. That word, you need help, it kind of like, I, it just penetrated my uh, bullshit, you know, my uh, disguise, my, yeah, yeah, I'm so cool. Um, and I was like, like, that's truth. Like, I can, that he's telling me the truth and I need help and my life is falling apart and I'm trying to pretend like it's not and I'm trying to go on like it's not, but it is. And, um, and I decided to give whatever, whatever process that they, um, that they offer, I decided to give it a chance. I'm like, well, I got nothing to lose. I've tried everything else. So what they wanted me to do was just to renounce everything that I've been doing, to get rid of all my amulets and, and all those things and, and say like, hey, I'm going to be with, with Jesus now. Like, I'm going to be with Yeshua. I'm going to be with God, with the light and not with the darkness. And I was like, well, I mean, this is something that I've been... I've been walking along this path for 15 years, this path of darkness, and this is where it led me. I mean, I thought that I was going up, but everything is falling apart in my life. And, and it's like, and I've tried to solve it by myself and with my meditations and my mantras and my substances. And I try to solve it through... Uh, shamans and gurus and it would be you know a temporary solution for a day or two or a week so i would feel better and i would feel like yeah yeah i mean this is what i was looking for and then i would lose it again and i would be back where i you know where i was so it's like well you know what i gave the shaman my all i've, I've you know i'm gonna I'm going to try it again, you know, I'm going to give this my all. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I mean, I don't have any options. And when I went to, to the first um, prayer session with Jose, uh, that morning in particular, I was very anxious. I had, um, I had very demonic dreams, these demonic attacks in my dreams. I was just being attacked by demons who would show me filthy sexual scenes involving my family members and things like that it was just just horrible satanic stuff um and i woke up in the morning so anxious and to control that anxiety i just chain smoked my cigarettes and just sat there like i didn't go out of my little i had a little teepee hut i didn't go out of there i just made a fire and I smoked and smoked and sat there and just tried to deal with my anxiety. And then at one point, Jose called me uh, to the um, prayer session. I didn't really know what to expect, but this was really the answer to my intention of the mushroom ceremony of wanting to start over and a clean slate. So when they, uh, when he said, like, you know, renounce the gurus and renounce your your addictions and your bad habits and all your darkness I was like well that's kind of like what I wanted anyway and I was like okay like I renounce it you know and I renounced it and I confessed my um, sins and I renounced my um, my darkness and immediately after that prayer session uh, my addiction to tobacco went away and I, and I tried to stop smoking through ayahuasca and in Peru and then you know I thought that you know in maybe by drinking ayahuasca I can stop smoking I, I couldn't stop it um, but I it just went away I just 
I came out of that session, I was like, here's my pack of cigarettes, throw it into the fire, boom. Like, that was like after that I smoked like maybe once or twice more. Just once was just to try to see, you know, like what it would feel like and it didn't feel good. And the second time was just very, the second time I was just very anxious. Um, was when my my girlfriend got uh, kidnapped in in uh, Mexico City, and I didn't know I didn't even know that she got kidnapped. But it was like the spiritual anxiety was so overwhelming that I went out and I bought cigarettes and I smoked one or something or two. But yeah, so what I was I mean, what I'm trying to say is that the effects of that prayer was were immediate, and and also there were other people. In, in refugio on that property and and they were I could hear them throwing up and I could hear all that things were happening through prayer alone and I realized that this was something that I was looking for all along it was like I um, that's what I was looking for I was I was looking for a shaman or somebody you know a spiritual figure who didn't need to take a substance who who could just do it spiritually that's that's what I was interested in from the very beginning and I got used to, you know, during those eight or nine months in Peru, you know, people drinking ayahuasca and then they throw up and they have visions and experiences and healings and whatever. And here I was in Mexico seeing the same thing, people throwing up and having visions, experiences and healings and miracles, but without taking any substance. They were just, um, they were just um, being prayed for. So I could see that the, the prayer really worked. And during that um, the short time that I spent over there in Mexico. I mean, it, it wasn't like a solution. It wasn't an immediate solution, like everything in my life just suddenly like fell into place. It wasn't like that. I was like still deeply, deeply messed up and, and broken and hurt. And But I would, I would get, at least I would get these moments of light. At least I would get these moments of happiness and healing. And, and it was like, I would feel healed for, you know, this much of, of a day and maybe throughout the day a couple of times. And, and that, was, that was enough for me to basically continue along, along that way, you know, and, and, and continue to give it my all and, and to continue renouncing my past. Um, so I was, um, yeah, I mean, I, I got there, I got to that center just before Easter, Pascha celebrations, and, um, and I started this whole process, and then a lot of people showed up for the celebrations, and I just didn't want to be around people, and I left, and I went to town. I mean, this was probably, it was, it, I mean, I know it was my old self, it was like my old... Um, man that needed to re actually die like I should have just stayed with all these people but I was I was antisocial I didn't want to see anybody um, and I mean it was already like I mean I was already pushing my limits there because when when I um, came back from Peru I was so antisocial I couldn't talk to anybody I was literally at the lowest point in my life there was nothing that I could talk to anybody about like I was completely just it was like my soul was in another world. I was already like in hell. My soul was in hell and my body was just over there. That's, that's how bad it was after I, came back, after I came back from Peru. I couldn't communicate with anybody. Um, sometimes I just needed to drink like, you know, 10 beers or something to just be able to sleep. Uh, it was bad. And... Um, and... To finish the story, I got baptized. I, I had, you know, Jose and Ella baptized me in the river. And then I, I, I went back to Canada and I published my book, Shamans and Healers, and I got it out there. And the, the book, nobody freaking read it or, <laughs> you know, nobody read it. No, it, I don't think it made any impact. I don't know. I don't know what it did. It, it was a lot of work. And all the shamanic community that I was part of, they were like, like you're a loser basically why are you writing about christianity and christ and and saying all this stuff against shamanism and, and they just basically 
booed me. That, you know, they, they, they were like, I'm not, you know, this book is shit. Uh, give it like a one star review on Amazon. And uh, that didn't help. So there was not, I mean, I didn't get like a, uh, any, any sort of expected reward for, for writing that book. Um, where I um, I wrote all the, you know, I gave all the names of everybody and it was just like a super honest story, even though it might have been naive and I might have been, gun I might have been gullible and naive, but I mean, I, I, get, I spoke the truth. But uh, yeah, the, the book didn't go anywhere. And then my sort of Christian journey continued. And I wrote a second book. And this was all in the, in the, within the Protestant sort of Protestant circles, and uh, and then by two thousand seventeen or so, well, starting really in fourteen or fifteen, but culminating like seventeen, eighteen, I started coming back to the to the Orthodox Church, you know, and I realized I love my I love the Orthodox Church, I love the Orthodox Church, and it's like. Um, it's an amazing church and I wrote a third book and the journey continues and you know there's been overall overall like since my coming to Christ since my uh, acceptance of this path of light I mean it's been like night and day like it's been so much better than before it's been so much better it's been such a blessing like I've been able to live off my artwork I've been able to, uh, I mean, I have so many great friends and collectors and people who helped me out and I got my beautiful home, my children, my wife. I mean, I'm just, I'm so blessed, but it hasn't been without um, challenges. It hasn't been without uh, major, major difficulties and losses and problems either. And um, and sometimes when these uh, challenges and losses and problems get overwhelming, like I start to lose, I start to lose my connection with God. I start to lose my, I don't know if I lose my faith, but it's just like something's preventing me from praying. Something's preventing me from seeking God. It's like all these mundane things are again demanding my attention, and all these pro all these problems are everywhere, and it's like. You gotta deal with these problems. You gotta solve them. But the more you deal with them, the less they, the le you know, the worse they become. Because um, Jesus says, um, "Seek first the kingdom of God, and everything else will come." And and when we flip that upside down, we start seeking other things. Then you start losing the kingdom of God. And well, let's just say, uh, like I've been very blessed. Like I've been very blessed uh, with the understanding of scripture and all all kinds of things like i can open the bible and it speaks to me right now but there's still there's still this block this wall that says like you know don't open the bible don't pray because you got other stuff to do and why don't you watch a movie why don't you you know listen to some music why don't you go and work or blah 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 and you know so there's always these challenges and um and there's a lot of resistance. Like I've been feeling a lot of resistance when I've been really like I've pretty much stopped praying for the longest time. And and um, it's like I'm aware every single day. I'm aware that I need to start praying again. And it's like, but how do I do it? There's like this resistance within me that doesn't let me do it. It's 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 weird. It's I've tried to deal with it, and I you know it's just. Um, so today I made the decision. I'm like, I got to get back to prayer. I got to get back to my spiritual life. I got to get back to that fire that I had before and that connection that I felt with God before. And I started, I don't know, I, I went on YouTube and uh, I don't know why, but some stuff, I keep seeing these people that I admire and, and, and also that I would never imagine being Christian. I keep seeing them uh, give their testimonies, which is like, it's really cool. So today, um, Russell Brand came on. I remember seeing Russell Brand's movie, and it was like so outrageous, like that African Child or whatever that movie was. It was such an outrageous movie, and so you know wrong on so many levels, and about drugs and all these things. 
And I was like, this guy is cool, right? Like, <laughs> I remember seeing that movie like 10, 15 years ago, whatever, whenever it came out. Um, so this guy suddenly is giving a testimony about coming to Jesus and about, Je you know, Christ. And, and he's talking about it in a cool way. And he's really got the theology right and everything. I was like, I was like, whoa, like, that's so cool. And then, you know, so I watched that and then, and then, Brian Welsh from Corin comes on and uh, in those little YouTube things that, that, you know, suggestions. So I watch his testimony and I'm like, like, I, I get teary eyes. I, I mean, I got I'm like, wow, this is like such like powerful stuff, man. And, and I felt like watching those testimonies made me, um, um, you know, it gave me strength and it was like it brought me closer to to god and jesus and made me want to say those prayers which i was avoiding to say and i you know i could pray this morning and then i said well you know if, if these testimonies have been a blessing to me and i can see how god is like functioning through these testimonies and he gave me grace through those testimonies to and gave me strength to you know to come back to to the Lord and you know seek him again then I gotta do my own I gotta uh, like I've been putting it off for so long it's like I gotta do my own I gotta put it up maybe it's gonna help somebody and you know have the same effect on somebody else so that's why I did it um, today um, and um, yeah it's been really fascinating to watch all these people coming to Jesus um, Jordan Peterson on his way to becoming Orthodox Christian, and and Brian Welsh from Corn, I I was watching one of his videos. They've got shirts with the Orthodox cross on them, which is a special cross, and they got like the icons, Russian icons behind them. So, really, really, I mean, God's doing something. There's some really cool things happening, and people coming to to God um, that you wouldn't expect um, would ever come to Him. So. Um, yeah, I just want to put my, my story out there and um, may you be blessed. I hope God blesses you. Um, forgive me for um, whatever shortcomings I have. And um, if I said something wrong, may God forgive me. And I hope that God blesses you through this video. Bless them, Lord Jesus. Bless them, Lord. Use me as a tool. And I bless you too. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.